morning. Um, we're going to start just a little bit different this morning. Uh, we're going to go way back in time, and we're going to invite you to grab one of those hymnals that are in front of you. Now, you better listen to me because you might be on the wrong song. Um, and so I invite you to grab one of those hymnals in front of you and turn to hymn number 83. We're going to sing together, Be Thou My Vision. Uh, we have a little technical difficulty, but it's all right. Jesus is still on his throne, and so we're going to stand and give praise to him. So let's stand and sing together. Be Thou My Vision, hymn number 83. Welcome this morning on this Lord's Day to the gathering together of First Baptist Church, Avon Park. As we gather this morning, we want to welcome you if you're visiting with us. Uh, one way that we can get to know you is by you filling out a visitor card. Those are in the pew backs in front of you. Just fill that out, place them in the offering plate later in the service. Also, restrooms are available, men's through this double door to my right, and to my left, the ladies through that double door. Uh, we have a members meeting planned following our uh, worship service this morning. So if you're a member of our church, just encourage you to stick around um, afterwards as we uh, do some uh, work as a congregation. Also, uh, as a way of just an announcement, um, our uh, brother in Christ, Gerald Wicker, passed away yesterday morning. And uh, the funeral service for our brother will be this coming Saturday here at the church, uh, this Saturday, uh, viewing at 10 o'clock, and the service will follow at 11 o'clock. There will be no meal afterwards. Um, as uh, the families requested, they just had one a few weeks ago. So be in prayer for the PV family and uh, for those traveling in uh, for the service this week. Well, friends, uh, because of our technical difficulties, uh, we're doing uh, things old school this morning. And so I'd invite you to grab one of the hymnals, uh, excuse me, one of the Bibles in front of you, not hymnals. Um, uh, we're going to read from Psalm 110 together this morning. Um, so I invite you to turn there to Psalm 110. I'll give you a moment to, to find your way there, and I'll help you out by finding it myself. Psalm 110, and, and uh, we're going to read uh, this passage together and then sing. Psalm 110. It's found on page 509 in your pew 
Bibles, if you have a black ESV Pew Bible, um, it's found on page 509, and we're going to read this together, and then Lord willing, we're going to sing with some lyrics that are not in your hymnal. So it'll be fun. We'll see. Let's stand and read this together. We're going to read this together. Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power in holy garments. From the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. Psalm 110 tells us about the Lord's work about how this mighty king would come. And this is King Jesus, whom we've gathered to sing praises to, to worship. And we're going to change the order of service just a little bit here um, because we can and because Jesus is on his throne. And we're going to sing together, Jesus paid it all. Is that okay, Miss Nona? It's found on pay, pay, uh, hymn number 249. We might do like just a little hymn sing. We'll just do some random hymns here. Uh, does that sound fun? Yeah, Mona's like, no, let's not do that. 249 in your hymnal, we're going to sing Jesus Paid It All. 249. lead us in a prayer of praise. Father, we come before you to give you the praise and the glory, for you are worthy of our praise, worthy 
of our worship, worthy of our adoration. Father, we give you the praise that you sent your son to die for us. As we've just sang that Jesus paid it all. Every last bit of our sin was paid by Jesus on the cross. And our hope lays in the resurrection of Christ. That Jesus is victorious over sin and death. And that Jesus now, today, you sit high and lifted up. You are the risen and ascended Lord. And we give you praise that you reign in glory and power and victory over your enemies. That there is no one greater than you. As your word says, you are the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And we give you the praise this morning. We lift you up for the work you've done. And we praise you, Holy Spirit. For you have breathed life where there is death in us. When you, while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, Jesus, your spirit was poured out upon us that we might be able to believe in you, might be able to trust in you. We give you the glory, Father, Son, and Spirit, for the great work you've done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning our scripture reading is from Hebrews chapter 1. The author of Hebrews paints us a very short picture here in just these four verses about this risen and ascended Lord, this Jesus that we worship this morning. Hebrews chapter 1, the author says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This passage reminds us of the the transcendence, the supremacy, the preeminence of Christ, that he reigns and rules not over this universe, but over all of God's creatures, even angels in heaven, that through this power he has enabled us that we might walk in newness of life. And as we respond to the word this morning, one of our deacons, Terry Wall, is going to come now and lead us in a prayer of confession. humbly do come before you today to confess our sins to a holy and righteous God. Lord, we know that we are sinners. We live in a fallen world. But as Christians, as we grow in our sanctification, in our spiritual maturity, Lord, that we are called to confess our sins and to repent of our sins. And that we strive to live a life by the example that you set before us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we confess our sins this morning, we never want to confess sin without the hope of the gospel. Our confession this morning is in the hope of Micah chapter 7 and verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression? This is the God whom we confess our sins. The hope of the gospel is that God has dealt with our sins in the death of Christ. That's what we celebrate this morning. What we sang earlier in Jesus paid it all. And what we're going to sing now in the power of the cross. We're going to sing the power of the cross. So I invite you to turn to uh, hymn number three, or 232. Hymn number 232. We're going to stand and sing together the power of the cross.
had a better order of service plan than, than we did. So we submit ourselves. I don't even have my phone. My goodness. I'm all out of sorts now too myself. Well, friends, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of petition. And as we think about the many needs before us, I want us to just kind of think about particularly uh, lifting up continually the, the PV family. Uh, as well, uh, we've had a bit of uh, COVID run through a number uh, of our Sunday school classes and members, a number of members out today because of COVID infections. By God's grace, no one um, is uh, seriously sick or, or hospitalized, but are many under doctor care. But we could praise God for that this morning uh, and just ask that he'd continue to sustain our members uh, that are that are sick and, uh, and many other uh, ailments going on in the life of our church. And so I want to lead us now in that prayer. Let's pray. We come before you, Lord. You are the one who is sovereign over all. And we come bowing before your throne seeking your grace this morning and that you would supply our needs. Father, we are gracious, we are thankful, and we are thankful for the grace that you've given to us through Christ that we might be able to come before you and pray and and ask things. We do not ask in pride, but in humility. We ask that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayer is that your will be done in the life of these members. To that end, Father, we pray for the PV family and and we pray that you would sustain them in the loss of Gerald. And, and Lord, just a, just a sweet reminder of the grace that you give upon us, that, that the rain falls upon the just. It is a reminder that, Lord, you bless those who live righteous lives. And, and you gave such long years to both uh, Gerald and his wonderful, wonderful wife, Barbara. And we're just so thankful for both of them and the, the many decades, that over 70 years of faithful service to this congregation. Uh, as a reminder to us of what it looks like to follow Jesus as king. Father, we pray also for the member, the, the many members this morning who are, who are enduring COVID-19 infections. And, and Lord, we, Father, we, we know that many of us thought this was over, we were moving beyond this, but here it is again. And so, Father, pray that we would not grow weary, that we would not uh, grow frustrated, that we would not grow discouraged, but, Lord, continue to trust you that you have a plan and purpose for our life. Bring healing to their bodies. We pray that you would uh, give them quick recovery from this, uh, that they might be able to be with us again. We pray also this morning as we gather this afternoon in our members meeting that you would give us wisdom as we seek to do the work of ministry here as a congregation. Father, that there would be evident unity among our diversity, that, Lord, we would be unified in our love for one another, for the love for the same Jesus, the same blood that flows through each of us the blood of Jesus. Father, help us, I pray. This morning as we think about the world around us, we, we want to obey your word, and your word tells us to pray for those in authority over us. And so this morning we pray for President Joe Biden. We pray that you would uh, give him health and safety. We pray, Lord, that you would give him wisdom to lead our country well. Uh, well, Lord, we pray that you would surround him with gospel witnesses and pray that you would surround him with godly people that would speak the truth into his life. And, and lead him to faith in Christ. We pray that he would come to know Jesus as both Lord and Savior. Father, we pray for all of those that are in, are in his security detail to, to ensure that he's safe and secure. Father, we pray for them as well, that they would keep him safe. And, and uh, Father, we just give you the glory. And thank you for the country that we live in and the freedoms that we enjoy. Even though we may not all agree, uh, we are thankful for these freedoms. Lord, we pray also uh, as we think about the gospel work going on here in Highlands County. Lord, we lift up to you this morning, First Sebring. We pray that as they uh, are coming to the end of their pastor search process, Lord, I pray that you would give those that are uh, on that committee wisdom. Uh, Father, I pray that you would give that congregation wisdom as they are uh, ready to call their next pastor, that it would be a man leading them in godliness and Christ-likeness and committed to the exposition of your word and commitment to preaching your word as Christ Jesus has called us to. Father, for us this morning, I pray that you would speak through your word, that we would know you better because we've opened our Bibles, that we've thought about you. Help us, Father, I pray, to keep seeking heavenly things. Help us, Lord, to have our, our eyes focused on eternity, not here in this world. To that end, Father, I pray that our minds are renewed in such a way that we keep thinking heavenly thoughts. Help us, Father, we pray, to remember these heavenly truths that you've called us to, that Jesus Christ has, has died and that we've, we've died to sin and death. We've died with Jesus and we are alive in Christ today to live forevermore, to walk in newness of life. Help us to do that, we pray. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Well, as our ushers come forward this morning uh, to receive our tithes and offerings, 
I want to remind you this morning, uh, over the last uh, few months, we or a couple months, we've been talking about Jarrett Williams. Jarrett's uh, planning to go with the IMV on a mission trip, and we've uh, encouraged you to, to give a love offering. We've been collecting that over the last uh, uh, few weeks, and we wanted to uh, kind of set an end date. Uh, if you plan to, to help support Jared as he goes to, to Malta uh, to serve with the IMV this fall, uh, we want to encourage you to have those that love offering in by July 31st. That's the last Sunday of this month, and uh, so that we can have a check cut and he can send it off to the IMV to pay for uh, his travel and expenses while he's there. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in the members meeting uh, coming up, but just want to encourage you this morning that if you plan to give, to give today or the, over the next couple of weeks, um, in preparation for his trip. Well, friends, we gather to sing praise to God, to remember that all things come from our Creator. Everything we have on, everything we have in our wallets, everything we possess has, has been given by God. And so we're going to sing now, uh, again, you're going to need to turn in your hymnal uh, to hymn number 11. And we're going to sing the just verse 5, don't get scared uh, there when you look at that. Uh, we're just going to sing verse 5 of hymn number 11, so stand with me. As you've turned there to hymn number 11, we're going to sing verse 5. Our sister Joy is going to lead us, and then uh, Travis is going to come and lead us in a prayer of thanks. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you with thanks. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. God, we thank you for this body of believers coming together, Lord. And it's a privilege that you hear our thought, our prayers today, Lord, You and you allow us to worship you, Lord. And God, we we thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, Lord, and that guides us. And God, we thank you for your many blessings. God, we thank you just for the future glory that is to come. And God, we thank you for your son who died on that cross, Lord. And it's through him that we are clean in your eyes, Lord. And God, we ask that you would just bless the tithes and offerings that are about to be received, Lord that they may be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated.
John Bunyan, in his great allegory called Pilgrim's Progress, describes an incident where the main character, Christian, while on his pilgrim, pilgrimage rather to the celestial city, decides to leave the main highway and takes his own path, which seemed to him an easier path to take. But this particular path that Christian found himself on led to a region that was ruled by great despair, which ultimately led him to Doubting Castle. Eventually, Christian is captured by great despair and kept in the dungeon there, where he is advised by despair to kill himself. The giant there told him there was no use of continuing his journey. All was lost. Well, as he spent some time there in the dungeon, as the time went on, it seemed as if despair had truly captured Christian, had truly defeated and conquered him. But Christian was not alone in the dungeon. You see, when he had went off on his path, he took with him a friend named Hopeful. And Hopeful was reminding him all throughout about their previous victories in life. And one Saturday night, about midnight, as the two sat there in the prison, they began to pray and continue to pray until morning. Now, a little before the dawn of the day, Christian, surprisingly, he began to break out in passionate speech. And he said this, What a fool I am to lie in a stinking dungeon, when I may as well be at liberty. I have found a key in my pocket. It's called promise. And I am persuaded that it will open any lock in Doubting Castle. Then said Hopeful, this is good news. Good, brother, pull it out and let us use it. And the prison gates flew open. Brothers and sisters, promises are powerful. Promises have the power to unlock even the darkest despair that one finds themselves in. The church that Paul is writing to here in Colossae had grown in despair. They had grown frustrated in their sanctification. They had grown weary and tired of their indwelt sin. They thought that they would never overcome temptation, that they would never be free, that they were enslaved. Paul writes to this discouraged church to remind them of some powerful promises. Powerful promises that could unlock even their greatest temptations and sin. And Paul lays before them in this passage we're going to consider this morning these wonderful promises to motivate them and to motivate us in our, whole, in our pursuit of holiness. Now just to remind you of where we've gone over the last few weeks, Paul here has corrected the wrong approach to sanctification. Sanctification being that process of change in the believer's life that we grow little by little in holiness. Uh, we don't grow instantaneously when we come to faith in Christ. We don't receive instantaneous glorification. We're not transformed in that moment to be perfectly holy. But there's this process of change that happens in the Christian life. And Paul here is correcting a wrong view of that process. He reminded them specifically last week in verses 20 through 23 that the gospel alone is sufficient to transform our lives. As he writes this, if you've died with Christ, then be transformed. He builds off our death with Christ as the reason to abandon the teaching of these false teachers. And here in chapter 3, verse 1, he begins to shift the focus, if you will. He begins to shift it to discuss the implications of the resurrection on the Christian life. That is to say that not only the death of Christ changed our life, but the resurrection of Christ affects our life. That we are to live a new life through the resurrection of Jesus. And he lays this foundation for us in these first few verses of the chapter in order then for us to build upon in the subsequent weeks that we as Christians, because of what Christ Jesus has done for us, because of our union with Christ by faith, that we are united with Jesus, that we have the power in and of ourselves by the Holy Spirit to put off the old man, to put off our former ways, and to put on our new life. 
And the Christian life could be summarized in the process of taking off sin and putting on these new Christ-like virtues. That is what Jesus has called us to, as we're reminded in Romans chapter 6, that we too are to walk in newness of life. That's what it, friends, if you remember all the way back to when you were baptized, when you came up out of that water, that preacher said that you've been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. That is the promise that we have this morning that we want to think about. So I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3, if you've not done so already. Uh, Colossians chapter 3. We're going to be considering just verses 1 through 4. And Paul writes, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. What is Paul's point? Well, Paul's point can be summarized in this way, that the foundation of our pursuit of holiness lies in the redemptive purposes of God in Christ Jesus. That is, you will not be holy. It, no, not never. It is impossible for you to be sanctified apart from justification. Apart from what Jesus did on the cross, you and I will never be holy. But also, positively, that if you have believed upon Christ, if you have repented of your sins and trusted in Christ alone for salvation, Paul holds out to you, the gospel holds out to you, the promise that you will be holy. And that then is the motivation for us to pursue holiness. We pursue holiness because our future is fixed in Christ. And so this morning, I want us to think about living with a right perspective. When we pursue holiness, when we pursue following Jesus, when we, like Christian, are, are, are tempted to get off the main highway and go another path, we need to live with three right perspectives. Number one, keep seeking heavenly things. If we want to live with the right perspective, we must keep seeking heavenly things. Number two, we'll see that if we are to keep the right perspective in the Christian life, the right focus on the right destination, then we have to keep thinking heavenly thoughts. Keep thinking heavenly thoughts. And then finally here in verses 3 and 4, we will see that as Christians living with the right perspective, we ought to remember heavenly truths. Paul here reminds us here in verses 3 and 4 of a number of heavenly truths. Number one, as Christians, we ought to keep seeking heavenly things. Look at what Paul writes there. If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Paul here begins by reminding the congregation that they have been raised with Christ. He focuses on the resurrection of Christ and their union with him by faith. This, of course, is what he's already taught them there back a couple weeks ago in chapter 2, verse 12. If you have your Bibles open, you can see it there, chapter 2, verse 12. He says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. When you believe upon Jesus, when you trust in Jesus, you are united to the resurrection of Christ. You are believing that when Jesus died and was raised again, that he died for you and was raised for you. It was in light of then this new life, having been born again, that they were to pursue holiness. A part of the new birth, this is what Paul's arguing, this regeneration, being born again, resurrected, a part of this new life enables you to walk in obedience to Jesus. It's, a, it's the promise of the new birth. And Paul here exhorts them, in light of their resurrection with Christ, they are to seek the things that are above. Now the word seek here means to devote serious effort to realize one's desires. Literally, the word means to, 
desire. To seek after means to desire, to long for. Now, the, the, look there, he says seek the things. In other words, the verbal idea there is keep seeking. It's an ongoing activity. It's not a one time, once for all, I sought heaven and now it's over. But rather, it characterizes the Christian life. Christians are characterized by this ongoing behavior of seeking heavenly things. A number of translations like the New American says this, they are to keep seeking. Or the New Living translation, set your sights on. They were to desire heavenly things. The desires of their heart were to be desires of heaven. Now notice what Paul does here in between the command in verse 3, or, or verse 1 rather, in between this command of seek the things that are above, he, he sandwiches this exhortation between the risen Christ, and notice here secondly, the ascended Christ. He says, you've been raised with Christ, and and then he calls their attention. He says, lift your eyes a bit, get it off of the earth, and look to Jesus. In other words, to seek the things above is to seek where Christ is. They were to seek heavenly things because Christ sits in power and authority over all things. To say that Christ sits at the right hand of God is to say that Christ Jesus is has power and authority. This is what, if you remember back to what we read at the very beginning of our service in Psalm 110, this messianic psalm points to a victorious king who rules and reigns over all of God's enemies. Friend, that includes you and I. A part of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is Jesus putting his flag and saying, they are mine. It is a declaration that I have authority over their life. I rule and reign over my enemies. And through the cross, we've seen here in Colossians, that Jesus has defeated all of God's enemies, and thus he is able, friend, to deliver us not only from death, but from sin itself. Because of Christ's work, we are free from sin and death. This idea, again, points to what we've considered Earlier in chapter 1 of Colossians, in verses 15 through 23, that Jesus Christ is preeminent over not only the old creation, the current creation, but he is also Lord of the new creation. He is supreme over all. And through the gospel, we have been united to Jesus Christ. And therefore, we are to desire the things he desires. To say that you are in union with Christ is to say that you desire the same things that Jesus desires. So when you read your Gospels, and you look at the things Jesus did, the things that Jesus was about, what was he on mission about? What was he about doing? Well, the Bible summarizes it this way, that Jesus wanted to do the Father's will. And so to say that we desire to be with Jesus, that we desire heavenly things, is to say that we desire for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we are to desire and to be where he is. In other words, our union with Christ affects not only our mind, which is what we're going to consider in point two, but also our will. You see, a part of the lordship of Christ is not only transforming the way we think, but also the way we behave. And this is the point that Paul is going to put forward, friend that there is no such thing as a Christian who does not grow in holiness. And this is a frightful truth that we want to think about, that if there is not fruit in the life of a so-called Christian, then they are not a Christian in a biblical sense. Biblically, theologically, in reality, those who have been born again grow in holiness from one degree of glory to the next and Paul exhorts Christians here and us corporately to seek to be where Jesus is where Jesus rules and reigns we must then allow this present reality of our resurrection with Christ to transform the way we live you have been freed from the bondage of sin and death to 
follow Christ. When, when we say, I can't overcome this sin, I can't, I can't kick this habit. If you are in Christ, yes, you can. You have the power of the Spirit indwelling in you. You can overcome sin. It, this is not a matter of the will. This is a matter of the truth today. Eternal life is not a future reality, but a present one. Friend, obedience to Christ reflects our belief that Jesus is ruling and reigning over all. To disobey Jesus as a Christian is to deny the truth of verse 1. It is to say that Jesus does not have power and authority over my life. That is why, as a Christian, we want to continually confess our sin and walk in the light because confession is acknowledging that we have sought the crown again, that we have sought the throne. And by God's grace, he forgives us of such behavior, but we must confess and repent. Friend, do you desire the same things that Jesus desired? Does your personal spending reflect the things that Jesus desired? Does your desire for worldly possessions reflect that your heart desires to be where Christ is? Do your spending habits, do your current earthly possessions reveal that you care more about this life or the life to come? What about your giving to this church? Does it reflect a, a desire to see many saved through the gospel? Or, or do you like to just spend it on things here on this earth, fleeting temporal things? Friend, do you live in light of eternity with your eyes here on this world, on the fleeting pleasures of sin? Or do you seek what Jesus sought in his earthly ministry? What about your relationships? Do you desire the same things Jesus desired? Jesus desired that all men would be drawn unto him. Do you desire your friends and family to come to know Jesus? Do you desire that? Why don't you ever tell them about it? Why don't you ever invite them to church? If you desire the same things that Jesus desired, if you're seeking the things that are above, then you ought to seek to see Jesus as Lord of even your enemies. Even those you despise. Jesus regularly exhorted us in this way. To be driven by a desire that Jesus had. Living with the right perspective means to keep our eyes seeking heavenly things. In this way, we grow in holiness. In this way, as our desires are transformed by the Spirit to have the same desires as Jesus. But secondly, we see here in verse 2 that we are to keep thinking heavenly thoughts. Paul is helping these, this church here and helping us with the implications of the gospel. If we've been saved through the work of Christ, then our lives should be transformed. There's a correlation between salvation and transformation. As I argued earlier, there is no such thing as a Christian who's not transformed. A Christian that becomes more and more like Jesus. Paul's exhortation, though, is not to work hard to be holy, nor does it endeavor done in our own strength. So don't confuse this as a works righteousness, that you do holy things to be accepted. That's not what Paul's arguing. Paul is arguing that the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ empowers us to walk in holiness. Let's consider here verse 2 in a reverse way. Look here at verse 2. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of this earth. Paul here exhorts them last, first positively and then negatively. Let's consider first the sort of negative there in the second half of the verse. Avoid the temporal and fleeting pleasures of this world, he says. He says, don't, don't, don't think about earthly things. Don't have your mind set on earthly things. That is in contrast to heavenly things. Paul calls on them here to avoid worldly thinking that saturated their prior life. You see, part of the Christian life is, is changing the way we think, reprogramming our minds. You see, when we lived in rebellion against God, we lived thinking certain things, but our our minds have to be transformed. What earthly things does Paul have in mind? We'll look no further there, there verses 5 through 11. Look at a number of things. It says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. In other words,
words, what, how, how did we think? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Notice here, these are, 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 are more heart sins than they are external sins. On account of these, he says, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with this practices and put on the new self. Notice here what he says, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. In other words, your mind is being changed to think differently. This does not mean that the material world and earthly concerns are unimportant. Rather, he is shifting the way we think. And here's what we need to take away from this. That our minds should be shaped by our destination rather than what we see along our travels. In other words, our mind needs to be focused on where we're getting, not by looking out the the windows as we travel along the way. We're on a journey, friend. That's why I love Pilgrim's Progress. You want a copy of Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress? You can go to the bookstore after church and you can pick up a copy yourself. Let me encourage you to read it. It is a great picture of the Christian life, that we are on a journey to the celestial city and there are many things along our paths that will get us get us off. But so often, Christians are tempted to look around rather than keep their focus on heavenly things. We're reminded here, for example, in Hebrews chapter 11 of Moses, who is a man who had his life shaped by the destination more than the world he occupied. You can jot this scripture verse and meditate on it later. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater worth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking for the reward. Friend, does your mind focused on heavenly things? Notice here positively, Paul says, think on heavenly things. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. They were to set their mind on eternal things. To, to, to set your mind on something is to give careful consideration to it, to, to meditate on it, to consider it, to dwell on it. As one translation helpfully captures, they were to allow heaven to shape their thinking and their wills. Again, the the verbal aspect here is ongoing. That's thinking, not just merely I thought about heaven and I'll be there one day and now I'm just going to think about other things. But rather it is a daily activity of thinking about eternity. They were to take up with this regular activity. In other words, they were to fill their minds with heaven from morning to evening. Friend, do you do that? Now, what are the things above they were to think about? Well, that's what Paul goes on in verses 12 through 17. This is what Paul lays out. He says, listen, God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts you should have, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. He goes on to list out a whole litany of things that they were to think about have their minds and eyes fixed upon these this new life that they had they were to have minds shaped this is what paul reminded the church in rome do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind friend our minds need to be renewed they need to be reoriented recalibrated new testament author and scholar nt wright helps capture this idea Someone who truly understands who he is or who she is in Christ is further along the road to genuine holiness than someone who, in confusion, anxiously anxiously imagines that the new life is the result rather than the starting point of the daily battle with temptation. In other words, salvation, repenting and believing, in that moment you repented and believed in Christ, That's not the finish line, that's the starting line. The finish line, as we'll see in a moment, is glorification, that you will be made holy as Jesus is holy. But friends, here's the point. 
Since we have been raised with Christ, this present reality should shape our minds. Who Christ is and where he now reigns should shape our thinking and our desires. As we think about spiritual matters, we are living today as if we are already present in the new heaven and new earth. We ought to think about this is the reality. This is the perspective. On Wednesday nights, uh, as we've been teaching through Romans 8, I've regularly thought about this, this in a proverbial way. Whatever has your mind captured, whatever you're anxious about right now, whatever it is right now that is consuming you, I want you to think, if you're in Christ, Will you be so worried about it in a trillion years? If you're truly born again, you're going to live forever. And I want you to fast forward in one trillion years from today. As we are dwelling on the new heaven and new earth, are you going to be as worried about whatever is consuming you right now? I can't pay my bills. I don't think you're going to care about that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't pay our bills. That means we should, but should it consume us? Whatever it is that's consuming us right now, Put it in light of eternity. Don't let your ambitions, one author says, be earthbound, set on transitory and inferior objects. Don't look at life and the universe from the standpoint of these lower planes. Look at them from the standpoint of Jesus. Now I want you to think about that. F.F. Bruce helpfully captures this passage and saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go up there and I want you to sit from Christ's vantage point, how do your problems look? How does your thinking change? Where do your priorities in life change from Jesus' vantage point? He is not so concerned about your earthly comforts as he is about ruling and reigning over the hearts and lives of men and women around you. Friend, I wonder this morning, what captures your thoughts? What is it that's currently running through your mind? What is it that is dominating your every waking thought? The current events of today? Gas prices? Your 401k, your retirement account? A job that you wish you'd have? A promotion that you desperately need? The struggles of this fallen world? Sin in your life? Worldly possessions and things. What is it that you are captivated by right now? Christ is calling you to be captivated by the wonder and beauty of a new heaven and a new earth. Where things are restored to its proper order. Where he rules and reigns transcendent over all. Do you allow your mind to to be influenced by this new world? In order to have your mind renewed, you have to open your Bible, friend. You have to regularly read it. Because you see, when you read the scripture, it's not about just gaining a data download, kind of a content delivery. Okay, I know who was king in 1500 BC. That, that, that's not Bible reading, friend. Bible reading is is putting on a new pair of glasses where you see this world from God's vantage point. Where you see your sin and your life and the people around you the way God sees them. It, It gives you an entirely different perspective. That's what Bible reading ought to do. Transform your mind. Friend, let me just commend the regular reading of God's word with other Christians. Get together throughout the week. Open God's word together. Think about it together. Read a a Christian book together. Help one another have your minds shaped by the new heaven and new earth and not by the earthly things around us. You see, living with the right perspective means keep means that we keep seeking heavenly things and keep thinking heavenly thoughts. Our will and our mind is to be transformed. Finally here we consider lastly that we are to keep remembering heavenly truths. We ought to keep remembering heavenly truths. Look at this, verse 3 and 4. Paul lays before us in conclusion 
two truths that we ought to keep remembering. Number one, that you've died to the former things of this life. Paul Paul reminds them there in verse 3 that they are dead. Look what he says. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That little word for there it means support. Paul is supporting what he has just said. He's reminding them of some heavenly truths. He reminds them that they are, they've died. Notice the juxtaposition of death and life. He says, well, what do you mean, Paul? I'm dead and I'm alive at the same time? What does he mean? Does he, is he talking to a bunch of dead, dead people? Not at all. He, he's writing to them to simply mean that they have ceased their former life. To, to say that we have faith in Jesus is to say that when Jesus died, our former life died. He killed it. It's no longer on the throne. It's no longer in power and authority. As Paul questioned the church in Rome, he says, What shall then we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, By no means. How can we who die to sin still live in it? When Paul says here in Colossians 3 that you've died, he is, he's saying that you've died to the power of sin in your life. He doesn't mean that they're holy. He doesn't mean that they're spiritually dead. But rather that the rule and reign of sin has been overcome by the life of Jesus Christ. Friend, that is a truth to claim this morning. When the devil wants to whisper in your ear and tell you, you'll never overcome that temptation. You'll never overcome that addiction. You'll never be rid of gossip and backbiting and bitterness in your life. You'll never be able to love those who've hurt you. When the enemy whispers that, you are to remind him that that former life has died and that you are now alive in Christ. This is what Paul means. Look what he says. He says that, That your life is hidden with Christ in God. It's a beautiful picture. You've died to the form of things, but you're alive now in Christ. Your life is hidden in Christ. What does Paul mean to be hidden? Well, it means that, that we're kept from being seen. That is, that what we will be will not fully be revealed until the coming of Christ. Our life is is hidden, it's it's enveloped in the person and work of Christ. Friend, I hope that your mind is being put forward in this idea that, that if Christ is truly in control, if Christ is truly driving uh, history towards the end and goal that God has for it, then to say that you are united to Jesus is to say that your future is fixed. The status of our life is found in this union with Christ. It is a mysterious union. And what we will be is not yet clearly seen. We're hidden. But it will be one day revealed. One day when Christ returns, all things will be made known. All things will be made clear. Everything will be made right. And everything will be exposed that is wrong. And this new life with Christ is the foundation of pursuing holiness. Jesus got, has got you. You're united with him. You can overcome sin because you've died to the former things of this life. But second truth here we see in verse 4. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Again, Paul holds out this future reality as a motivation to pursue holiness. When Christ returns, there is this instantaneous transformation, the Bible says, that we will be gloriously like him. Notice here, verse 4. When Christ appears, then you also will appear. Paul's building on this, this connection between the future of Christ's return and the future reality of it and the reality of who you will be. To deny the the second coming of Christ is to deny that you will ever be holy. But if you believe that Christ Jesus is coming again to rule and reign over all, then you ought to also believe that you will be made holy as Christ is holy. The 
return of Christ has an impact both on the future and on the present. This is what empowers us in our pursuit of holiness. This is the reality. Because that's true, I can live in light of the gospel. When Christ returns, then we will be like him. As Peter reminds the church in the diaspora, and when the chief shepherd appears, Peter says, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Or as John, one of Jesus' other disciples says, abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink back from him in shame. We will be holy as he is holy. Notice here again, lastly, he says here that he is your life. He's your life. In other words, we gain our sustenance and our sustaining ability from Jesus alone. The power to walk in holiness does not come from within, but from without. It comes by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. The motivation then to pursue holiness in the Christian life comes from this future reality we see laid before us. Since we'll be like Christ when he returns, we confidently pursue Christ-likeness today. When you put to death sin and put on righteousness, all you're doing is preparing yourself, getting a little ahead. You're preparing yourself for heaven. Friend, if you're not a Christian this morning, I want to remind you that this is the only way you can be freed from the bondage of sin. Sin truly is a taskmaster. You are a slave to it. You might might think that you're in control of your life, but the Bible says that, that sin has so captivated you, so captured our heart that we are slaves to sin, unable to follow God because of our sin nature. But if you'll repent of your sins, that is, that you'll, you'll, you'll make a conscious decision to stop living life your own way. The Bible promises you that you will walk in new life. If you'll believe that Jesus Christ came into this world to deal with your sin, to die the death you deserve and I deserve, and that he was raised to life, that you too can walk in the power of the gospel. Friend, I just want to call on you to believe on that today. If you want to know more about how to follow Jesus, all you need to do is ask the people around you. After service today, just ask them, hey, how do I follow Jesus? I need help. Teach me, show me how to follow Jesus. And they will help walk you in that way. Trust that Christ has saved you and you too can be free from the bondage of sin. Brothers and sisters, we want to keep remembering these basic truths. We want to not grow beyond them, that by faith we've been justified and by faith we believe we will also be glorified. This is what motivates us. And these false teachers had sought to find another way to holiness That was without a bloody cross. And perhaps that's you this morning. Perhaps you think, I can make my life holy apart from a bloody cross. And and friend, it will never happen. Through human wisdom and effort, one could overcome sinful indulgences. Never going to happen. Traditions won't do it. Rituals won't do it. Religion won't do it. Only the death of Christ and his resurrection and his ascension will do it. It's the risen and ascended Lord that can free you from the bondage of sin. Therefore, our pursuit of holiness must lay in these redemptive purposes. We must keep seeking heavenly things, keep thinking heavenly thoughts, and keep remembering these heavenly truths. Brothers and sisters, we do this again and again. We wage war until the perfect comes. Then we shall be made perfect. Let's pray. Father, we pray this morning for these dear saints. I pray that they would heed your word, that their gaze would be upon this celestial city that is to come. And Father, perhaps there's those here that have gone their own way. They have left the main highway and found themselves perhaps in Doubting Castle. Father, I pray that they would be reminded of the truth of the gospel, the key that unlocks every door. They would find hope and life in you. Draw us back onto the main things and the plain things. Father, I pray that we would be made holy as Jesus is holy. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.